You know, I walked I walked in this morning and I got greeted by like three people and hugged and then worship was amazing and the production team's making it happen from behind, you know, kind of b- behind the curtain of everything. Can we just thank our volunteers this morning? Aren't they amazing? Like just yeah. They're the best, they're the best. Um, if you were here last week, I, I was um, um, teaching on the armor of God. And if you're here this week, which I think most of you are here this week, um, uh, you have me again. And so I want to apologize if you don't like me too much. You got, you got a double-double right here. And uh, no, Pastor Matt and uh, Lisa are in Vancouver this week. They're just traveling the globe uh, from Idaho to Vancouver, Washington. And uh or actually Oregon to Washington, but, um, and so they're preaching. They'll be back next week for Easter, and, um, and yeah, they were texting me this morning. They're excited to be back, but um, I want to talk to you today about um, Jesus and the grace of God, and um, I'm hoping it's a good reminder for some of us, but also um, an encouragement, and we're going to, we're titling this talk today, Perfection in Process, Perfection in Process, and we're going to be reading out of Hebrews chapter 10. And verse uh, 11, um, the Bible, ta- one of the main themes in Scripture, if you're going to understand the Bible, is you have to understand what a covenant is because there are many different covenants. There's the Edenic covenant, there's the uh, Noahic covenant, there is the Abrahamic covenant, there's the uh, Davidic covenant, um, there's all these other ones. And then there's also the New Covenant, which is if we are followers of Jesus, that's the covenant that we are a part of. But what is a covenant? Um, and so just real quickly, um, a covenant... Uh, I had it somewhere and I lost it on my notes. Oh, here it is. Okay. A covenant is a chosen relationship or a partnership in which two parties make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. They differ, though, from a contract because covenants in nature are relational and they're personal. So God makes a covenant with his people, and it's because of Christ's death that we get to enter into what the Bible calls this new covenant. And what is this new covenant, and why does it matter? That's what we're going to be talking about today. But here is God's role in Scripture when it comes to a covenant, okay? And then we're going to dive into this passage. But here's, here's the four things that God does when it comes to a covenant. Number one is he's a covenant-making God. So he makes the covenant. You can look at this at Genesis 6 and 15, 2 Samuel 23, Jeremiah 31. He's a covenant-revealing God. He's a covenant-making God. He's a covenant-revealing God. Number three, he's a covenant-keeping God. He's always faithful to his covenant people and the covenant that, in which he established. And number four, he's a covenant-enabling God. He enables you to be a part of the covenant. Isn't that cool? He doesn't set some standard up here and it says, work at it and see if you can get it. He's a covenant-enabling God. So those are the four roles that God has in the covenant. And we're going to read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. You can follow along on the screen, um, and it says this. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice. This is talking about the Levitical priesthood, um, the sacrificial system, part of the Old Covenant, which can never take away sins. You know what they say the definition of insanity is when you do the same thing over and over and you're not getting the same result? That's apparently the Levitical system, (laughs) because it can never take away sins. Verse 12, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That word sanctified could also, it's translated other um, versions as being made holy, being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts. He's quoting here from Jeremiah chapter 31. This was prophesied about in the Old Testament. And and this is what God says, I'll put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Amen. Mm, I, don't, I don't know what you did this weekend, but that, that's good right there. Okay. Hey, okay. Um, I, I wonder about this, this verse 14. It says, um, it says, for by a single offering, the offering of Jesus on the cross, he has perfected, past tense, he has perfected you for all time, those who are being sanctified or made holy. Now, just imagine if you were an artist. I'm not. 
but imagine if you were. I, I can barely draw stick figures, okay? They just, yeah, I'm, I'm horrible at anything artistic. But imagine you had this, like, amazing pa- painting, and you were an incredible, world-renowned painter, and it was the best painting you ever did, and it was perfect. And everyone who saw it was like, don't touch that painting. It's perfect. And so you know what you're going to do? You are not going to tinker with it anymore. You're not going to, you know, mess with it, because if you did, you might ruin it. It's a perfect it's perfect art. Like, it, 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 like you, you don't want to touch it anymore. You don't want anybody else to mess with it either because it's complete. It's perfected. So I wonder, like, the Bible declares something over us that because of Jesus Christ, if we're followers of him, if we've been born again, the Bible actually declares over us that we have been perfected by Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Then why is he tinkering with us still? You know what I mean? Like, why is he still like, okay, it's perfect, we got really, to really fix some stuff. You know, it's like, what, what is going on here? And um, so why does God need to make us holy if we have been perfected? And here's why. As a Christian, you were saved the moment you believed. You are being saved every day, and you will be saved at the final judgment. You were saved. You're being saved. You will be saved. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, I became a parent, that, you know, the day my daughter, Elliot, was born. Uh, you know, that day. Now, do I know how, does any parent know how to be a parent when their first child just comes into the world? No, I don't. I became a parent, and I'm learning to become a parent. Are you tracking with me? I remember I got this job one time, and I don't want to say where, but I got this job I was not qualified for, and, um, well, it wasn't here. I mean, I wasn't qualified either, but but that's not what, I, I guess actually every job I can say this about, to be honest. And it was like, I, yeah, I was in that role, but I didn't, I, I wasn't really knew how to do that role yet. And so I was, in the, I was in the job, but I was also learning to do the job and become the thing that they hired me to be. Okay, so the point or the goal of the Christian life is not prosperity in this generic sense, it's maturity. Right, it's easy, it's easy to make children, it's hard to raise children. <laughs> Woo! And here's why. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It says this. Oh, um, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. There we, oh, thank you. For, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Isn't that good news? The grace of God saves you. What is grace? Well, it's used um, in a lot of different places in Scripture in a lot of different ways. It can mean God covering your sin. It can mean... The blessing and the favor of God that's undeserved, unmerited, can also mean the enable the enablement or the empowerment of God. So it saves us. That's what the grace of God does. But but look, it also does this. It trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. So grace not only saves you, it trains you, it teaches you, it molds you, it fashions you, it forms you. The cross is much more than forgiveness. It's also about formation, transformation in Christ. How many people know that transformation is an event and a process? Um, You know, I've used this illustration uh, before, but you become a member of a gym in an instant, but getting in shape is a process. You know, being born happens instantly. You don't have much to do with it, do you? No, you don't. You You have nothing to do with you being born. It just happens. Someone else is doing the work. But, but it's going to take some of your participation to mature and grow up. Listen, when you were born again, you didn't really do anything. Because it's God's grace that saves you. It's God, it's God who, it's, it's Jesus' finished work, the sacrificial lamb of the world, who actually, who actually makes you a new creation. And then the grace of God begins to transform you and teach you and train you into living out what he's made you to be. Um, I remember I taught our baptism class years ago, six, seven years ago, and uh, there was a man who was sitting in the baptism class, and um, in that class we talked a little bit about, you know, just kind of doctrinally, you know, like what we taught as a church, what we believed about the Bible and about the Trinity and all these, you know, different important things that people have questions about sometimes. And, um, and so we would have people do that class, 
Um, number one, because we wanted people to know, you know, what our church believes, like when they're getting baptized. And number two is we want them to know what they're doing when they're getting baptized, you know. And, um, and so there was this guy sitting in there, and he had only been going to the church, I think, for about a month or so. And a buddy had invited him, and I think he was probably 50, around 50 years old or so. And he's wearing a... a, a anyways, he's sitting there, and I remember him asking a question, and um, he says... Uh, I have a you know I have a question. I said, yeah, go ahead. And I think there was probably fifteen to twenty people there. And he said, you know, when I was eighteen years old, before that I was I was running with gangs and doing all this stuff. And and I got baptized in a church. And I remember the the pastor looks at me and says, okay, now go and sin no more. He goes, and then I kept sinning. He goes, and then about ten years later, I kind of came back to Christ and I got baptized again. And the pastor said, go and sin no more. He goes, and I kept sinning. And so I'm just finding this, this story out as we're talking. I realize this was his fourth baptism. And, um, and he goes, and I keep sinning. Why? Uh, you know, and I'm like, well, if you, if you really are born again, and if you come to Jesus, and you repent, you, you turn your life to him, he's going to make you a new creation. Okay. And then he's slowly going to beat out of you the stuff in you that's wicked <laughs> and make you into an adult in Jesus because transformation is an event and a process. And this makes me think of one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I, it's, I think it's 1 Kings. Um, there's a guy named Naaman who is a, uh, a warrior um, for one of the pagan nations and he hears about this prophet named Elijah and he hears that, like, the God of Israel is powerful and does all this crazy stuff. So he goes to Elijah's house, and he, and he knocks on the door, and he brings, you know, some, some, you know, like little sidekicks with him. And Elijah doesn't even answer the door. He doesn't, you know, he has his, he has his little homie go and answer the door. So his homie, you know, Elijah's homie goes and answers the door. He's like, how can I help you? And Naaman goes, um, I have leprosy, and I would like to be healed. I hear that the prophet Elijah, you know, has it going on. And, uh... And so I'm here to kind of get my healing. And so the guy, you know, Elijah's home, he goes back to Elijah and tells him. And Elijah doesn't even get up from his couch. He's probably watching the masters or something. And, um, you know, because he is the true master. And he, that was so dumb. That was the spirit of Matthew Carl Molt on me right there. Let's just shake that off. He would be proud, but I know you're not. So, um, so I say, so, so Elijah doesn't even get up. He's just like, go tell this brother to go dip himself in the, in the Jordan River seven times. So he goes and tells Naaman, and Naaman's standing outside, and, um, and he literally gets upset. And this is what the Bible says in 1 Kings. The Bible says that Naaman thought to himself and said to his sidekicks that were with him, I thought the man of God was going to come out here and wave his hand over me and I would be healed. In other words... I thought God was just going to go like this, zap, and poof, my problem's gone. Instead, the man of God gave me something to do over and over and over and over. Uh, you know what? I think this is how Christians are. I went to the conference. I did Dave Ramsey. I, you know, I... I I got prayer from Pastor Matt. I did, I did the marital counseling. I did this. I did that. And I asked the Lord, Lord, take away my lust and my pride and my ego and my impatience. And, and, and I became a Christian. And I started doing this. And, and, and I still have, like, I still have some of these problems and issues. And I, I, I thought being a, becoming a Christian means you're a new creation. You are a new creation. But then God starts this process that you didn't have before. And so God, you know, God through the prophet Elijah tells him, go dip yourself seven times. And he's like, and then Naaman goes, why don't we go to one of these other rivers that are cleaner and better than the Jordan River? He literally says this. In other words, I don't like the process in which he told me to do it. So you're like, man, I want to know God more. And, and, then, and then it's like, okay, dig into the Bible. <laughs> I want to hear from God. You're going to have to get in the prayer closet every day. And God gives us his process. Why? Because he wants to make us holy. God wanted Israel, his people in the Old Testament to be holy. Um, and I don't know if you've ever read some of the laws 
in the Old Testament, like specifically in the book of Leviticus, and you've just gone like this, huh? You know, and it's like, God, what were you thinking? You know, like, these are kind of weird. No shellfish. And then, like, how, I got to say, God is gracious, but he's also crude. Like, he makes bacon, and then his favorite people can't have it. <laughs> Talk about a sense of humor, Lord. Okay, Yahweh, that's not cool. And, um, but the laws of God are not arbitrary. They symbolically or spiritually meant something for the people. But the, here was the point of all these laws, okay? The point of them was this. God wanted his people to live distinct or different than all the other nations. So that the other nations that were on the outside of Israel, they would go, look, they don't live like we do. They don't, they don't, they don't do the stuff we do. And they're blessed by the God of Israel. And Israel is supposed to be like a light to the nations in that way, living holy, distinct from all the other nations, a different sort of people. And they would actually attract the other nations to a relationship to God. And that's the same heart of God for Christians in the new covenant today, that we are to live holy lives. Holiness means separate, distinct for a different purpose. Let, 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 let me... Let me play it for you like this. I remember um, I'll be married for five years in May. And, uh, yeah, we made it. And, uh, and so um, I remember going and getting, like, what I was going to wear for my wedding day. And I got this nice black, you know, jacket. And I got this Calvin Klein white shirt. And, and uh, got it, you know, fitted perfectly. And I got my pants. And I got special shoes just for that day. And now my brother and I, we shared a room when, you know, when I was living with my parents. And um, I've shared a room with somebody my entire life. I've never had my own room except for one month when I moved into the, our apartment that my wife was about to move into once we got married a month later. That was the one month of my entire life I had my own room. I shared rooms with my brother, my cousin, and my brother, my cousin. I've shared rooms with roommates. I, I've never had my own room. And, and um, marriage is like that amplified, you know, times 100. So, you know, I, um, I, I could explain more, but I'm, so my brother, um, I remember my brother had a dance uh, for school and he was like, can I borrow some of your clothes? And I said, yeah, I don't, I don't care. You can wear whatever you want, but you cannot wear this jacket this Calvin Klein white shirt that's fitted for me, these shoes, these black pants, that belt, or that bow tie. If you touch any of those, I will cut you. You know, like I, <laughs> I spent my hard-earned money on that, and that is for my wedding day. You will not touch it. You're not, you, I don't even want you to look at it. Why? Because this was my prized possession. It was distinct from all the other clothes because it had a specific purpose. That is what holiness is. You are, you are created to be holy and to live holy. And though you are amongst all the other clothes, God has a, a specific purpose for your life. He has a, a specific plan and a destiny for your life. And he's created you for something, not just to something. And God has created you for himself to be a light to the world. You are to live holy. And God wants to train you by the grace of God to live a holy life, a distinct life for him. Sin... Sin is the um, enemy of holiness. Sin is the enemy of holiness. Sin, all sin is, is really taking a good thing and perverting it. Like money, is, it's, not, it's not a sin to be rich. It's not a sin to be poor. It's not a sin to be middle class. It is a sin, though, to make money an idol and to live for that when you were meant to live for God. What does the Bible say? That the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Sex is a good thing that God invented. God had the idea. It would, he invented it. And when it gets perverted, it turns into sin. Most things that are sin are just something that God created that the enemy or that humanity has perverted or twisted for our own purposes. It's like using a $20,000 violin as a tennis racket. 
you can make noise using a violin as a tennis racket, but you can't make music. And you make noise when you live life your own way, but you'll never make music. You'll never be in harmony with God. And God wants you to live holy lives. Holy lives. I remember um, my, my papa and nana, they had a beach house in Lincoln City growing up that we loved. And um, you could see the ocean from it. And we'd go there multiple times a year, usually like on Thanksgiving and um, I remember we were there one time. It was just my immediate family. And, you know, the Oregon coast, it's beautiful, but it's cold. And, um, like, it's, yeah, so it's just, you know, you love it and hate it type of thing. That's how I feel. And, um, and I remember um, one, one year, we, my dad got us a kite. And it's, you know, super windy over there in Lincoln City. And so we're flying the kite. And I accidentally let go of it, and the kite is going towards the ocean and I just start booking it to grab the little handle and my dad just like panic panicking going no Austin stop no stop you know and just screaming at me and you know you have adrenaline and you're rushing after something and it's windy and it takes like a second to register and and then I hear him as my feet are getting wet and like it clicks and he goes it's it's fifteen dollars don't worry about it and I, like, I, I couldn't tell if my dad was upset with me or not, you know? Like, he was like, Austin, no! You know, it sounded like Batman, no! You know, and um, I'm like, ah, you know, where is she? And so, um, and my dad said, and he reminded me of the story that the year before that, my brother, who was like six years old, wearing this big poofy jacket from like, you know, the Christmas story, you know, can barely walk, you know? And my brother's out there, and he actually gets pulled in by one of the tides and gets brought under the water. And my dad literally, in all of his clothes, jumps in the water, grabs him by the back of his jacket and rips him up. And as my brother's just coughing, six years old, and, you know, a little moment of panic there. And so I think my dad probably had that in the back of his mind as I'm running after a kite. But the reason he doesn't want me to run after the kite is because the kite is not valuable. It's $15, you know. And the ocean is so much more powerful and stronger than me. It, it, it can just, it can rope you in if you get too deep into it. And that is just like sin. Sin is chasing after something that's not very valuable in God's eyes, but it's valuable to us because we, we're not, we don't really know. You know, we don't really understand. And God is going, you are my prized possession. And you chasing after that could potentially ruin your life. And I'm here to, and, and that's what repentance is. It's God saying, don't do that. It's not going to fulfill you. It's not going to sustain you. It's not going to bring life to you. It's not going to bring you joy. And that, that's only $15. We can, we can get a new one. And, and what do we do? as creatures we just chase after what the heart wants instead of what God wants so sin makes us do makes us chase after things with no value I, I remember being at a youth conference I was in sixth or seventh grade and one of my heroes was preaching and um, he's up there preaching and at the end of the service there's like four or five thousand people at this conference in Portland Oregon and he said um I, I just sense that the Holy Spirit just told me right now, there's somebody up here at the front, you have drugs on you right now, and God wants to set you free. And so, lo and behold, man, right there, right next to the stage, lifts his hand. The guy walks on stage, he has this kind of this big trench coat on, he walks up on stage, and they exchange, you know, words for a second, and he pulls out a bag with some drugs and a, and a pipe, and all this other stuff. And um, he says, and he just reaches out his hand. He says, I believe God's going to set you free today. And the young man puts it all back in his jacket and just walks out and then out the exit door. Now, as ridiculous as that might seem to us, that's exactly what we do when we deny the holiness process. God's going, freedom. And we chase after things that will bring us under the tide of an ocean you are not capable of swimming after, swimming out of. The old, in the old covenant, you, you brought a sacrifice. You brought a sacrifice. And I just, I want you to picture this. Imagine, 
This is the Levitical system, the Levites, the um, sacrificial temple system. Imagine carrying the animal. Imagine. It's like you're carrying the weight of your sin to the sacrifice. And I, I just got to tell you, I'd be looking at how many animals people are bringing. You know what I mean? Because I'd be like, ooh, you did something bad this year, didn't you? You know, you got three oxes on the back of a little wagon right here. You know, like, yeah, yeah. You know, I'd be like, what'd you do? Be for real. Don't lie to me. <laughs> like, I, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be scanning, you know, I'd be scanning. And they're bringing the weight of their sin to the sacrifice. And the Bible says this, which is interesting. Jesus is the high priest. The high priest was the only one, the only one who could go into the most holy of places. And he could only do it once a year on the Day of Atonement. He'd be the mediator between God and the people. And he was the only one who could fulfill the sacrificial system. And the Bible says this, that Jesus is not only the high priest, he's a sacrifice as well. He is the mediator and the lamb for us. Now, with all that being said, we're going to look at two passages real quick um, in light of what we just talked about. Hebrews chapter 10. This is literally right where we left off from. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. We ended on 18. Therefore, because of everything you just heard, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places... Because of the high priest Jesus and his sacrifice. That is through his flesh. Next verse. I'm going to read it right here. Do we got it? And since we have a great, uh, since we have a great, have a great priest over the house of God. Let us draw near. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day drawing near. As the day drawing near. We're going to read one more passage. This is earlier in the same book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. It says this. Same idea. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus knows what it's like to go through temptation and trial and hurt and pain. And he can actually sympathize with us. He can actually sympathize with us. Like the best counselors are the people who've gone through stuff and they can sympathize and also share the truth with you because they know. Jesus knows. He says this in verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Drawing near is only what the priests could do in the old covenant. They drew near or, as it was commonly said, they would approach the presence of God on behalf of others. Jesus made a way for all believers to draw near to God in any time, in any place. Because of him being our high priest, the mediator, and the sacrifice. Okay. Um, about a year or so ago. Uh, I, my parents had invited my wife, McKenna, and my daughter, Elliot, over for dinner, which I honestly think they, they just invite us over that much because they want to see my daughter. But that's okay. You know, I get free dinner out of it. They're like, hey, you should bring over your daughter, Elliot. And if you and your wife want to come too, you can for dinner. That'd be great, you know. I'm like, Mom, I don't feel loved. No, I love you. I, I, I love what you gave me. <laughs> A grandchild. I'm like, okay. And um, so... We get over there. We got over there a little bit early, and I didn't see any cars there. And my mom told me she was um, picking up something at the grocery store or whatever for that night. So we just waited outside um, fit for 15 minutes. My mom finally gets home. She pulls up uh, her car right next to mine, and she goes, she goes, honey, 
why don't you go inside? I said, because oh, no one's home and the door's locked. She goes, no, your dad's inside. I said, where's his car? Because it's in the shop right now. He's literally inside, pro- probably done cooking. How long have you been here? I'm like, at this point, 20 minutes. She goes, For real? You, you, you guys could have walked inside. You know, like, I had no idea. Food was prepared, t- table was set, door was unlocked. I just didn't know he was in there because his car was in the shop. And my parents have stuff in the garage. They never park inside the garage. And so if the car's not outside, that means they're not home. My mom was gone, but my dad was there. And there, were, there was total access to their house. I just wasn't aware of it. I thought it was locked, you know. And I, I, think, I think that's how sometimes we might feel about God, about the presence of God. Christ has unlocked the door. You can draw near with confidence, not with shame, but with confidence to the throne of judgment. No, no, the throne of grace that empowers and enables and covers and blesses you and favors you. It's unlocked. Christ has opened up the doorway to the throne room and the presence of God in our lives. And we can draw into his presence with confidence, with full assurance of faith. Because the one who is promised is faithful. That would be Jesus. We are able to go into God's promise. Jesus paid the price so you could know his presence this is what Jesus did but I think a lot of us we struggle with guilt or shame in some way or another now guilt is not all bad because somebody who doesn't feel any guilt for anything they do is a psychopath are they not like they don't feel any guilt for anything they do they will do anything they want to do and feel no guilt for it they have no conscience, like, you know what I'm saying? So guilt in and of itself is not entirely a bad thing. It's saying what I've done here is wrong, and, and we, we should feel some sort of that. I mean, there's a godly guilt, a, you know, a godly sorrow that leads us to repentance, but there's also a worldly sorrow. There's a, a, what it does is it produces a shame, which is different than guilt, right? It's, it's I am wrong. And, and I think what happens is there's a fear, in it to, you know, and we become timid, and maybe hesitant when it comes to really going after the things of God in our life. And, I, you know, my, my daughter's going to be three in June. And I just can't imagine her in two years from now walking up to me saying, you know, Dad, I think I belong in this family be, because I'm, I'm worth it. I would be like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> like, you're part of this family because you were born into this family and because we named you and clothed you, like, because you're our child. It has nothing to do with if you were worthy of being our child. You were, you were, you were a molt by birth, not by action, you know? Like, you can act like a molt or not act like a molt, but you are a molt because you were born a molt, and you're welcome, okay? Like, the Bible says that we are born again. That is to be in, the, in this new covenant, in the family of God. And you might not feel like a, you may not feel like you are, you may not, you, you may have made some mistakes. You, you, you may have felt like your life has been on track. You may have feel stagnant in your relationship with God, but you are who God says you are. You are who God says you are. I have to be careful with my daughter. Here's what I've realized. I have to be careful with my daughter now um, because like with the music I play and the, the things I say because she just starts repeating everything. And a few months ago, I, I, I really picked up on this because... Um, I would say something, she, you know, she'd be kind of like walking around holding her stomach like this, and I would say, Ellie, does your, does your tummy hurt? And, she, and she'd go like this, my tummy hurts, Dad. i go, oh, okay, are you hungry, or do you need to go to the bathroom? She goes, Dad, my tummy hurts. i go, okay. You know, I'm trying to like find out, like, what does that mean? And five minutes later, she'd walk back up to me, Dad, my tummy hurts. I'm like, okay. Five minutes later, walks up to me, Dad, my tummy hurts. Ooh. And then, the not joking, the next day, I'd go in there, wake her up, I'd go, good morning, goo. That's what we call her, goo. Like, good morning, goo. She goes, dad, dad, my tummy hurts. Just all the time. And I'm like, you're a liar. No, it doesn't. <laughs> you're grounded. <laughs> and what I notice is, I have to be careful what I say to her or over her because she would, number one, begin to agree with what I was saying, and, and then that would lead her to literally living out what I said over her. <laughs> 
she would actually begin to like, oh, dad, my dad. I wonder, I wonder if that's, that's how a relationship with the father was. We began to agree with what God said, and then we'd actually begin to living it out. Not as if it were true, but because it was true. You know what, God? I am the righteousness of Christ Jesus. You know, God, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You know, God, yeah, I messed up there. Yeah, yeah, and I don't want to do that. God, I, I want to live whole, a holy life, not because you will accept me, but because you have accepted me. God, I, God, I want to be transformed by your grace. Because, God, you actually want to see me thrive in life. You want to see me, me mature as a Christian. You, I, I want to know you. I want to be like you. God, I, God, I want that. And, and, and God begins to train and teach you and mold you and fashion you and form you because of this new covenant that you are a part of in Christ Jesus. Jesus. It was by his death and burial and resurrection that we are able to have a relationship with the Father. Nobody gets to the Father except through Christ Jesus. And thank God that Jesus came not to save those who thought they were righteous, but to save those who know that they were lost. And Jesus comes and dies in our place to, to eliminate every single, the death and, the, and hell. He, he comes to conquer all of those things and sin so that we may not just be forgiven, but that we may also walk in freedom today. Listen, listen, God not only wants to call you something different, he wants you to begin to live out the truth that he's spoken over you. This is the power of God that operates in our life. I remember... Um, I remember uh, years ago, I was struggling reading my Bible, except for when it came to like studying it for like, you know, teaching, like, but just like going, going to the Bible but for myself, like just to know God, it was a struggle for me. And then as a result of that, it was a struggle to pray. And then as a result of that, I just felt like stuck and stagnant and, and just no hunger. And I knew there was something wrong, but it was like, you know, whatever. I, I, I don't know what to do. And um, I remember, I remember going to like this Bible reading plan I had that was printed out. And I just looked at the day for today and it said to read this passage. And the passage is about the death of Jesus. And I thought, I'm not going to read that passage. I've read that passage like a hundred times. You know, like, like I remember the story. And I just felt like, I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that moment. And I'll never forget it. He said this. You remember, but you need to be reminded. And I think sometimes, like when it comes to the gospel, you, you, maybe you remember, the, you know, all the passages about the love of God. You remember the gospel. You, you, you already know what Easter is going to be like next Sunday. You're like, yep, we're talking about the resurrection. It's Easter Sunday. You know, like, like you remember, but you need to be reminded. We live in this, the, as they say, the information age, which is constantly new information. But, you know, I think that can, um, I think that can transform us in, to some extent. But I also think this. I think what we remind ourselves with daily is what's going to really transform us. It's what's going to really transform us. Okay, we're going to end with this. I don't have these passages up on the screen because I added them during worship. Sorry, friends. Bible says this, that Jesus has sat down. He has sat down. The priest stands daily offering these sacrifices, which never really took away sin. It never freed them from the bondage of sin. But Jesus, with his perfect sacrifice, laid himself down. And then when he was done, he would sit. He would sit down. And a lot of us, not all of us, but a lot of us, what we do for our work is we sit down to work. We sit at a desk or a table or whatever. Some of us, we, we, you know, we, we do physical labor. Maybe we're standing, but a lot of us, we're sitting down. Well, in that time, especially with agriculture and all that other stuff, you didn't sit until you were done. I mean, you were working in the field and you were plowing and doing all these things. And, and Jesus sits down because the work that he has done is finished. And not only does Jesus sit down, listen to me, he makes you sit down. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says this, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. But it also says this, the next chapter in Ephesians, I therefore a prisoner of the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 
Ephesians 5 to the next chapter. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. The scriptures in the New Testament, they talk about how we are seated with Christ because of his finished work and that we are to walk a certain way. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk in love. We walk in unity. We walk in obedience. We walk in a manner worthy according to the call of God. The word walk in scripture, it's actually a term that would be used for how we live our lives. And th this is the whole point today. You are seated with Jesus Christ today, no matter how far you've gone or no matter what you've done. It is by the sheer blood and the grace and mercy of God today that he has seated you with him. The work is over. The sacrifice is done. Get on your behind and sit on the chair with Jesus because he has finished the work. He doesn't need your help. You're not good at saving yourself. Every time you did that, you got caught in an ocean. But thanks be to God that the sinless, spotless lamb before the foundation of the earth was slain on your behalf and he has seated you but because he has seated you he causes us to walk differently to walk in newness of life where once we were walking in darkness and we were walking in sin and we were walking in bondage and we were walking blind and deaf he has he has made us sit with him and now we walk in love and we walk in life and we walk in holiness because the grace of God not only finds us it forms us into who he's called us to be we are not looking to be a church of people who just make decisions to follow Jesus accept forgiveness and then cut it short there there's not a dead end on this road that is just the beginning of your new life he wants you now to walk in the newness of life that Christ has and it's not just for you it's so that we might be a light in Richland and Pasco and Kennewick and Umatilla and Hermiston and what and every Every surrounding area God has called us to be like a city set on a hill a city that can't be hidden because we are holy we're called out and he has perfected us so he's sanctifying us are you tracking with me today and I think I think there's people in here today you remember, but you need to be reminded of the grace and the mercy of God. I need that reminder every day. God, it's not by what I've done. It's not by who I am. It's by your grace and it's by your mercy. And God, thank you for that. When you're reminded of the gospel, it will cause a, a, a response of worship in you, a response of gratitude. I mean, just try to have a bad day and, and at the same time while being having the most grateful day of your life. It's just very difficult. Try. Try not, try, try on the days when you just don't feel like worshiping. Try reminding yourself of the gospel and see if you just can't help but worship God. Today we celebrate Christ's death and burial. His death and burial, which has opened up the door for his presence. The veil that was in that was in the in the temple has been torn and the spirit the holy spirit lives within us. Okay, we're going to wrap up here. But I just want to pray for some for someone in particular. I just sense the Lord telling me that there's um there's a father in the room this morning who's been struggling with um um severe depression just dark depression, at times suicidal thoughts. And I just sense the Lord telling me this. You, you, you put on a strong face, you bust through your work, you, you don't complain too much because you want to be a strong front for your family. But I just sense the Lord want me to tell somebody today, he sees you, he knows this ocean's too strong for you. You're not going to beat it by yourself and you need freedom and the grace of God to unlock something. I'm going to pray for you. And if that's you, I'm not trying to embarrass you, I'm not trying to call you out. I'm going to have everyone close their eyes because I want to pray over you. Um, but I sense that there's a father in here today struggling with suicidal thoughts, depression, and, and, and you've just been burying that underneath work and all these other things. And the Lord brought it to light today, not to condemn or shame you, actually to free you from that so you can walk in the joy of the Lord. That is your strength. Amen. Would you close your eyes? I'm, I'm going to pray. If you're just in here today, you just shoot your hand up real quick and right back. I just want to pray for you. As a church family, we're standing with you. If that's you, we just lift your hand real quick. That's awesome. Awesome. That's awesome. Come on, let's pray together for, for these people who lifted their hand today. Father, we thank you that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And that, God, we don't have to live in depression or in suicidal thoughts. 
God, thank you that you love us, you care about us. You're not here to point the finger to judge or condemn, but God, to bring freedom in our life. Thank you that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. God, let them walk out of this place today with a burden that's off their shoulders. God, thank you that your grace is going to not only save, but enable and empower them and teach them and form them and mold them. God, I, I, I pray today that every attack of the enemy that's been on their mind, God, it would be freed from them right now. Thank you that, God, there's true freedom by your Holy Spirit. God, we, we just, we don't even know who these people are next to us, but God, we just, we stand with them in unity today going, God, there's freedom in your name. There's freedom in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, for your freedom in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you for every single person that's in this room today. God, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the story of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. God, let, let that reminder today be a spurring on in our worship and in our praise and our gratitude. God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace that covers us. Thank you that there's not one person here who deserves it, but God, you freely give it because of your faithfulness and your patience. God, lead us unto repentance. Lead us to be a holy people. And God, let us be a light to those who are living in darkness all around us. In Jesus' name, come on, somebody said amen. Amen. Can we stand up today and worship Jesus and be thankful for the gospel? Come on, let's worship him today.